Okay, so I, I thought I'd just begin uh, at the beginning, uh, which is, I mean, obviously some of this is fairly, uh, you know, emotional <laughs> material to go through. What what was the kind of impulse? What what made you want to start making the movie and, and, and dig into this material? First of all, I want to say that I'm very sorry for you that you <laughs> have to go through this very rational <laughs> analysis of the film because um, the film, as I said, um, you know, it was released about 17 years ago, but of course before that first public screening uh, there was a very long time of coming towards this uh, film which uh, involved basically a lot of time spending watching these home movies and then starting to feeling uh, entitled to actually make something out of these home movies and then going through the process of editing the film and going through the process of finding my mother's letters and writings and you know so it's a really long process <laughs> and uh, as I said before also for me is um, it's interesting because every time I didn't watch the film now today uh, although I did uh, speak in a master class earlier today about the film and about the use of uh, private home movies and but um, you know every time the film shows me something different because it's a kind of live matter because it's like a family album that is not just a fixed uh, you know, peace is not, th these images are not just fixed in time, although they belong to a specific time, but they relate to us, they relate to me, and I think they relate to you uh, according to who you are and from where you look these images from. And so, uh, you know, the, you may relate to these images because maybe, you know, they remind you of uh, images that you may have seen in your family belonging to, you know, two generations ago. But it's, uh, so for me, it's really something that is <laughs> continuously in transformation in a way. And this is interesting because this uh, is, uh, you know, something that is to do with, with this specific type of images, private images, home movies, they are shot with a specific intention or not a specific intention accidentally, but then they end up being something else. And after maybe 40, 50, 50 60 years, these images were shot. They uh, perform a different function today for us, which is not just you know, bringing back the memory of the times of times that you know have gone and so on. But you know, we have a knowledge as viewers and spectators and. You know, in my uh, situation as a filmmaker and editor, we have a knowledge of greater history that is around what was shot inside this small 60 millimeter or Super 8 uh, frame. So the element of time, I think, is very important in um, when watching this kind of images and so this, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I wanted yeah. to say that. No, definitely. And yeah. uh, because I feel, yeah, for me also the film is a different piece every time this presented. And uh, because I am a different person and this is part of my story. Uh, and so I am a different person now than I was when I made the film. For instance, I made the film before having children, and the film is to do with motherhood, and I was only a daughter when I was making the film, and I am also a mother. And so, you know, there's many different issues that the film is uh, continuously somehow yeah. interrogating me and uh, compelling me to think further. Yeah. I mean, it's almost, I mean, also you might have made a different film if you had made it today almost. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because uh, also since we mentioned Gianfilippo Pedote, who's producer of the film, this film and this kind of films are only able to exist because uh, there are films that are the result of a process and of a time that has been allowed. I mentioned that for you know, a few years I was just watching 
these reels that my grandfather shot and then I dare to sort of subvert the linear narrative of um, you know this upper class Italian uh, family and you know to tell the story from my own point of view coming from you know after two different two dif two generations and these kind of projects are not just a product of the work of one single person, but of a team of collaborators. So obviously the, the role of the editor you may uh, sense is a very important one in this kind of film because it's a montage film, but also the people around the editor and the filmmaker supporting uh, the, uh, these uh, two roles are very important. So this film, for instance, was not the outcome of a commission work, obviously. It was the outcome of a very personal urge to answer your question. So I started making film because it's, you know, I found this footage and I felt I had to do something with this footage. I was already a filmmaker. There was something that is, you know, these images uh, prompted me to say something about not just her but about me who I was or was coming to be and so um, it's, it's a combination of coincidence and uh, intentional and unintentional but the result is the process you know it, it, the result is the result of a process of work mm. so also all the different choices in terms of the editing the narrative structure the use of sound and music is all you know part of a process it's not thought about beforehand mm. Yeah, it's a process of discovery as you go through all the materials. And uh, what what was it like bringing these materials, which, as you mentioned, are private materials, into you know into the public? Like, how what, how what was your decision process in in what you wanted to to share? I didn't want to share anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the thing. I was being very uh, egotistic in a way, but. Uh, I just really uh, wanted to make the film f for myself. I was a filmmaker already when I found these reels, and so I had uh, the skills, if you like, not, not just the technical skills, um, in order to work with this material. So I was moved by a very personal urge, but then when I started working, first with the editor and then I started you know, sort of sharing what we were doing with some friends and colleagues. We soon realized that, you know, the story we were telling, the story of my mother was not just important for me, but maybe it could relate to other people mm -hmm. as well. And so then this is when I say how much this film is part of really, um, yeah, it's really the work not just of one person, but a, a team of people who were sharing this emotion. Mm. And uh, of course, this is a, you know, the, it, it's this specific story, but is this specific story is also paradigmatic of a certain generation of a certain time. Mm. And so it's okay specifically to do with Italy that moment, but is only speaking, is also speaking to other people in other latitudes, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. And, and you start with, uh, well, you don't start with, first you have the, the record that you're playing, uh, which is an interesting, you know, ar archival thing to draw on. Uh, but then you have footage of, of a wedding, of uh, your uncle's wedding, which is a very universal, you know, ceremony. Uh, and it's something that usually is a very joyful ceremony. But for this film, it's really the kind of the beginning of showing and explaining the gap between what you're seeing on the screen and, and what your mother was feeling and, and starting to feel uh, throughout. Um, so, I mean, was, it, was that a kind of conscious decision to start with something that, you know, on the outside is just the picture of happiness? Well, this, uh, the fact is that I, I was working with this type of material which came from one source, the source being uh, my grandfather's amateur uh, 60 millimeter in this case, 60 millimeter and Super 8 films. So I didn't go out and look for other material. I went out to look for my mother's journals, my, my mother's letters, and I found the record. So what you actually hear, you know, at the beginning of the film is uh, coming from that 
45 RPM record. And so it's all true, <laughs> but it's all true, but it's constructed through my own uh, perspective and through my own uh, knowledge and understanding throughout this process of research uh, about what happened mm -hmm. to my mother. And, um, and so since I was working with only this type of material, of course I was only working with images of babies, children, anniversaries, celebrations, weddings, which are the actual, you know, the main subjects of home movies. So I, you know, I was confined to that private domestic domain, if you like, and um, I worked around that. And I, also by spending a lot of time with these images, I started to reinterpret these images and also um, in the film, the way the film is co constructed is is the the voice is basically con contradicting what the images are showing, and so the voice is like the really inner voice, while the images are showing the glossy happy surface. So the film is constructing along this dynamic of of. Um, juxtaposition and so the voice is contradicting what the images is showing and so by the end of the film and this is what I went through somehow by the end of my experience of viewing these images basically I regarded upon these real life images as completely false because they were not telling the true story. Right yeah it's not as if they were doing home movies where someone's just sitting there depressed. Uh, you know, it's 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 you know you're never actually seeing that, so you're really giving a voice to to her basically, um, and that that can be shared you know in in public in the same way. Uh, I mean, what's interesting is that this is this is a period where I, I would think that depression is not really very openly thought about. The sort of feelings she uses the word the void at some point of falling into the void, but this is probably a period where that's not really something that you can even talk about you know, much less, you know, put in a home movie? Well, no, of course, yeah. home movies are uh, only uh, yeah. depicting uh, happy moments, the travels, the journeys, and also at that time, you know, you were only able to shoot if you had a bit of money to waste <laughs> on, on film. And in this case, these films were shot on 60 millimeter, not even on 8 millimeters. That means that really, you were really saving up uh, filming for the, you know, the cheerful moments. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this is the nature of home movies, I think even today in a way, because it's true that there's a difference between home movies and amateur filmmaking. And nowadays we're much more used to, you know, using the filming device anywhere and ev everywhere, but um, anytime and everywhere. But um, still there is this, dynamic, you know, between the subject and, and, and the actual lens that is filming, so people feel always they have to be showing off or being happy yeah. in front of the camera, even today, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's clear from this, this home movie footage, you know, there's a lot of clowning around and laughing. It's, it's not an environment where your mother would have felt comfortable expressing any, anything that really didn't go with that general mood. Um, and it, it made me think, one thing this movie makes me think about is how you have the, the, the culture, the larger culture at large, but you also, every family kind of has a culture, you know, and it, and it seems like that was also a culture that she couldn't really fit into entirely. Yes, um, is that a question? No, no sorry, it was a statement. It was a leading, leading statement, I guess. Um, but I mean, w w were there things that yeah, you? But also, the yeah. thing is, this uh, for me the interesting, well, the thing that I sort of uh, may, um, I was uh, compelled to think of is the fact that I acquired this material, I found this material, and then I, I'm like the daughter looking at the mother's images shot by the father. So this is, there's also a question of gender there. So it's always the male gaze, <laughs> you know, representing the woman. And I am a, a woman filmmaker, so I'm working on, you know, my own uh, family images, and I'm working on, you know, women's representation on 
screen in amateur filmmaking. And this is the reason why whenever the shadow would, you know, be in the frame, I chose to edit those shots in the film. So the shadow of the man who's there as a shadow, <laughs> you know, shooting images of his beautiful women, his wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, and so this, for me, was also interesting to kind of try to subvert that patriarchal <laughs> vision mm -hmm. of uh, you know, feminine representation by constructing a different narrative um, through the editing. So this is yeah. also yeah, for sure. part of the process. Yeah. Um, since you mentioned the idea of the male gaze, um, Laura Mulvey, who's an eminent scholar on the, on the subject, uh, basically, uh, could you talk a bit about her? And because she's actually uh, more or less she wrote a paper and gave a lecture that is more or less based on your film. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes, Laura Malvi, for those who don't know her, is uh, an important uh, reference for uh, uh, theoretical studies on cinema, and on she wrote a, a seminal essay on the male gaze. <laughs> And I went to film school in London in the 80s, and she was uh, one of the professors there. Only many years afterwards, I realized maybe how much important her teaching was to me when then I met her again when I was screening this film in London, you know, maybe after 15 years after film school. And then we met again. And, and then she saw this film of, you know, somebody who had been one of her many students. And she has been writing about this film because it has, you know, she recognized some important features in the film that connected to her theoretical studies. Yeah, no, it's it's in it's short. Yeah, it's it's perfect because some of the things she talks about are the the gaps that that you become aware of. First, there's the gap of the time in the sense that you know you're looking at time earlier times many decades ago, but also this idea of detournement, which is basically using old footage and just twisting it for a different purpose to communicate something new, um, which is, is very interesting. Um, one other aspect which we were talking before I wasn't aware of, could you talk about the, the kind of um, the construction of it? Uh, you, you make a certain addition where there's something you actually compose that you add to the film. Uh, yes, that is to do with uh, the sound, because uh, you know by now the voiceover is my voice. <laughs> but in the film, you know, I lend my voice to my mother, so I'm reading out her entries in her diaries. Uh, but at the beginning of the film, there's a, there's a text that I have written. The opening letter is a text that I have written, so that is... Um, if you like, it's it's a um, mise en scène uh, element, and that it's something that I decided to write uh, while working at the film. So it's not something that I have decided beforehand, but I during the editing, you know, I didn't know how, you know how this film should start, and then I realized that maybe I could use the same narrative device of the correspondence, the letter. And so I started to write this letter that um, it's a fictional letter in a way, but it's it's a letter that I wish she had written to me in order to tell you know the story. And so this is how the film begins, and it gives also some information about the fact that this woman who's talking is not longer here, and so she's speaking from another time and dimension. So that creates also. Uh, in narrat narrative terms, a certain you know setup. Yeah, and and speaking of the letters, was was it hard to obtain any of them, or was was everyone in your family kind of willing to to share them, or did you already have the letters? No, the letters were also preserved in a, in an attic, uh, in another home, <laughs> and so all this. Things were kept there, you know, and I felt, or maybe they were preserved because I was meant to do something with these uh, films and journals and letters. So, and then I went looking for the medical reports, which I had to, you know, request from the clinic, and so there was a bit of research done, of course. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's yeah, it's crazy when you look at the 
particular years, uh, you know, when when she was in the the um, in the institution, and basically it's a years. Th these years are when feminism is really becoming a big force and developing. It's 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 kind of a you know sad irony that that's happening. It, you know, was was it satisfying to kind of be able to give her a voice in this way? Uh, that you know, it shows because the the stuff she's talking about imprisonment, you know, it could almost be something that would then turn into you know, something a feminist scholar would then write about in terms of trying to describe the feelings of the time. Mm. Well, um, when the film was made, I worked on the film, uh, you know, in a kind of private uh, way, uh, but then the, when the film was released, I, uh, I started having a lot of feedback also by women who belong to her generation. And so the feminist reading of the film gave me a very important feedback on uh, how this film was not just telling the story of one singular person, but was telling a story that was shared by many other women of ge her generation. And so that, you know, the life of the film after the film was made, in a way, is as important <laughs> Um, as uh, you know, the, the the time when the film, you know, the, when what I, I went through when I was making the film. So this goes back to this what I was saying at the beginning of the conversation: how much this film is continuously raising issues uh, to do with the themes and uh, the narration yeah. and so on. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Since so, this movie uh, is originally from 2002. Do you do you notice even a difference between how people receive it then versus now? We should uh, ask the audience. Well, that's true. I guess we should. <laughs> but, uh, since yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, even in, in the did, did you have a talk back at the event earlier today or no? What? Did you have audience reaction at the earlier event today? Yeah, mentioned? today we I spoke at a masterclass yeah. with the group of uh, filmmakers who are also working uh, with uh, archival footage or private material and I know not only in this section but there's also new films by younger filmmakers who use private footage so it's, it's yeah. something that is relevant yeah, also to contemporary filmmaking. Um, and I wonder if you could, could you talk about the movies you made, you know, in the past 15 years, because you continue, this has become your specialty, more, more or less, working with archival footage. Could you talk about some other films you've made? One film actually was also presented here at IDFA mm -hmm. in 2007, which I consider a kind of follow-up from this film. You mentioned late 60s, beginning of 70s, the women's movement and so on, and after making this film, I made another film, and then I wanted to address the 1970s, and I made a film about different women's uh, stories in the 70s in Italy. So in that film, which is called We Want Roses Too, um, I'm also using um, archival footage, but not private archival footage, so I'm using institutional, educational, uh, experimental animation photographs and I'm also working with um, private journals by three different women that I um, I didn't know these women I, the journals I found in a in an archive that collects private diaries mm -hmm. so I went on uh, you know yeah. in history and uh, yeah yeah they're definitely all worth tracking down well, I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately, but Alina, thank you so much.